ちは、えー、私はアナジョナスと申します。まあ、日本なので、ちょっと日本語でまずちょっとあの挨拶した方がいいかなとちょっと思います。<笑>まとめ、後であのプレゼンやるときだけに。えーまあ、ベルテクノロジーズからですけれども、えー、そこでキャラクソリューションアーキテクトとして勤めておりまして、で本日は、まあ、先ほどの話にあったと思うんですけれども、IoTK のソリューションに関してちょっと説明して,、えー、し,たしていただきたいと思います。よろしくお願いします。So,、um, before we had a very simple world, not too long ago,、um, say four years ago, where we had like a main office and we had some branch offices and everything was fine. And even then, we were looking at trying to consolidate our data centers into one location. It was a very popular thing at the time. And that kind of made sense when we only had, you know, maybe in an email server somewhere out at some pet place, and we wanted to put that into a same centralized location. That's fine. But it makes very little sense today in this world where we are adding on the edge locations that we have、um, and the aggregation points for the edge that we need to have. And in addition to, all, to that, all the different public、uh, cloud service provider、um, networks that we also need to hook up to and、um, run our workloads in. So, today's world is way more complicated than the one that we used to have before. And I know that there was a recent report by Cisco、uh, that、uh, suggests that by 2022, we're going to have 28.5 billion devices, end user devices, online、uh, and networked. So、uh, that's a staggering number, and we have to utilize all those lessons that we learned on doing device management and, and data management in the,、uh, the private cloud as well as the public cloud arenas and、uh, deploy those、uh, or use, like, utilize those lessons also on the, on the edge and the far edge locations.、Uh, many times when we're talking about IoT and、uh, the data that we're getting from all those sensors and devices, One of the biggest questions is where do we put that data? Do we put it into one of those big cloud service provider networks directly, or do we put them somewhere else? We can, of course, put it in our own data center, but in that case, leveraging all those great services that we have available at the public cloud service provider becomes difficult. So, one option and something that many people are looking into right now is to do cloud data co location, which is putting your data at a peering point. Where it is cl、uh, close enough to the big cl、uh, cloud service providers without actually being in one of those locations. So, that,、uh, for example, Equinix is one company doing those type of services.、Uh, in that case, you can put your data there. You can mount those volumes that you have uh, into uh, the different clouds, and then you can run services against them、uh, so that you can have full freedom over how you utilize the data and what cloud services that you leverage to analyze that. Now, if you go and look a little bit at、uh, The, the entire end to end layer that we have in here. At the far end, we've got the, the edge devices,、uh, then we have、uh, micro data center. Let's see if we have, oh, we actually have this micro data center and aggregation points for that. We have our own data centers, the network operation center, and then we have various cloud service providers. So we've got to manage the whole thing. So you need to have a management layer that goes across everything. This can be quite complicated to put in there because it has to span so many different regions. And you have to have a data layer, which of course then takes the data, sends it on to towards either to the public cloud or some other location.、Um, and we split it up in a few different areas here. So、uh, there's quite a few different challenges when it comes to this. We won't talk to,、uh, about all of these, but generally what we find when it comes to IoT is that customers、uh, they have three areas which are the most concerning to them. One of them is the actual management of the IoT devices. How do you do zero touch deployment? And how do you manage them afterwards? How do you patch them, make sure they're up to date? The second one is how do you、uh, communicate with all those、uh, edge devices, the real sensors, for example? Like if you put this in a factory or if you put it into a, a warehouse or somewhere where you have humidity sensors and temperature sensors and vibration sensors, how do you get all that data in? How do you communicate to those different devices?、Uh, that is another challenge. And the third challenge is In many cases, it's not just getting the data. You have to send commands. Maybe you have to take that camera and, and swivel it 30 degrees to the left, or you have to change the RPM of the motor. How do you send commands? Those are the areas. So,、uh, we're going to focus on a couple of these things now, which is the data ingestion. How do you get data in? And then, how do you control devices? So, EdgeX Foundry is very good at those two things. EdgeX Foundry is not great at managing devices. It's quite rubbish at it actually at the moment, but it does the other two very well. So,、uh, EdgeX Foundry, the、uh, kind of logo for this is,、uh, is an octopus, which is kind of, you know, it's a good fit because it's got many arms and stretching those arms out both to the edge as well as to the cloud can cover everything. 
But I'm in Japan, I usually see this and, and I get hungry because they have takoyaki. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, we have, this started off at that, right? So there was a guy called Jim White, and Jim White had a kitchen, and in the kitchen he started making software. I don't recommend using the kitchen for making software in most cases, but it worked for him. So he started off there a few years ago, and Dell has since uh, taken that software, made it open source, and available through the Linux Foundation to everybody to use. And now, at this stage, we have quite a few different people working on it. They had actually um, a big release earlier this summer, version 1.0, and 1.0 is the release that made it ready for, for prime time, so to speak. It was more of a project up to then. Version 1.0 uh, is like the LTS, the long-term support release, where you can uh, kind of rely upon it also in production. It has better support and all that stuff. So um, it's now ready to be utilized, not just as a fun project to play around with, which honestly it is. It's pretty fun to work, work with just for fun, but you can now deploy it in production. You can feel that this is a real reliable solution that you can have every day for real outcomes. So as an overview, uh, it is obviously open source. It can support many different types of protocols. And we talked before about having devices in factories or you know, warehouses, wherever it might be. In there, you will have many different types of devices. They will speak different protocols. They will have different data formats. It speaks those, right? So you can hook it up to anything. It runs as a bunch of microservices in containers, and you can deploy those any way you wish. Then you can take data from essentially anywhere, and you can send it to anywhere. So it has plugins then for, for Google, for example, or for, uh, for Azure. Or uh, you can send data over MQTT to some random service somewhere that you are running. So you have all the freedom in the world to take the data from anywhere and send it to it. Edgex Foundry does not hold on to data long term. It holds on to it for a short period of time. But generally, it's, it just takes it in and sends it off. Right? It doesn't aim to uh, store data long term locally. It doesn't require an agent. And the reason I have this in here is that uh, many people, when they th think about Dell Technologies, they think about VMware. And they think about VMware and IoT, they talk about VMware IoT Center, or Pulse IoT Center, which um, requires an agent. You need to have an IOTA agent in order to communicate with all those edge devices if you use Pulse. EdgeX Foundry does not require an agent. It can just ingest data from anywhere, which is nice. Now, it's just not just us doing it these days, obviously, right? So it has become quite a popular project. Uh, it's got, as you can see, over 80 members backing it. And in addition to that, um, you have a, a lot of these people are, are, of course, contributing code and being active in the community. Um, and one in particular is IoTech. So IoTech has taken this and they have made this into essentially a Red Hat model where they take, you know, of course, EdgeX Foundry is the open source version, <coughs> like CentOS. And IoTech is taking EdgeX Foundry and it's releasing a version called uh, Edge Expert, which is kind of like Red Hat Enterprise Linux where you have support, professional services, patching, some additional goodies that you might want to use. So you have the option of taking the project as is, you can use it if you wish, you can integrate it into your own solutions, or you can purchase a version that has the support and all the other stuff, uh, so that is available. And many other companies now too are leveraging Edgex Foundry to integrate it into their products. So it's, uh, like we discussed, microservices. They are written in several different languages. So we've got Java, Go, C, etc. A lot of the old Java services are being replaced now with Go, for example, right? So they're trying to shift a little bit over to, to that direction. Um, and you essentially collect data, and they have something called a device service. And the device service then has all those plugins that we talked about to hook up to different protocols and different types of data uh, formats that are used by edge devices. The core services hold on to it for a short period of time, like 30 minutes or so, and then send, well, it sends it on immediately, but you can actually have access to the data for a short period of time in between. Um, and then you export it out. This is actually, the export service has kind of been uh, changed over to distribution, or distribution services, but, or an application service. Um, but the point is you can take that and then you can hook it up to different types of cloud services, and if you wish to use those, you can send on the data somewhere else and it will have changed the formatting of it. So let's say you have different devices that are sending you data in different data formats. You can change that into XML or JSON or you know, CSV or whatever you wish uh, to make it easier to parse for your applications 
uh, wherever you want to send them and use them. Uh, all those microservices communicate in between each other using REST. So it's very standard. It makes this very easy to troubleshoot as well, in case you want to you know, install this and you want to run it. You can just use Postman or your favorite uh, client for this. You can, can access all of those microservices directly over a standard REST interface. It's very easy to look at the data and, and uh, change settings and all that stuff. And at the moment, generally, it's deployed via Docker or, or Docker Compose. So you have one YAML file, just a text file, which you just run Docker Compose and you know, uh, off you go. So it's very easy. You can actually get started with Edgex Foundry in under five minutes. Pretty cool. Uh, so, to go back to this a little bit, you have many different types of edge devices, right? Many of them speak different protocols, have different protocols. So you can have BACnet, for example, in the building, or you can have OVC UA in some other location, right? So you have many different types of protocols being used by all these different devices. In normal case, if you wanted to make your own IoT solution, you would have to overcome this in some way, which is a bit of a pain. <laughs> So that's one part, right? So you have many different protocols that you have to have support for. EdgeX Foundry has support for that. And if you're looking at a single protocol, let's say BACnet, for example, in there you might have many different types of vendors, and those vendors may have different types of models. So even if you have the protocol support in there, that's not going to be enough. You also need to understand what devices you're communicating with, and you need to be able to uh, separate out, okay, is this, if you get 52 from a device, is that 52 degrees centigrade or 52 vibrations per second, right? You have to have some way of mapping that out, the understanding of the underlying data that you are getting. Even though you can read it because you understand the protocol, you have to understand also what data format is being used. So EdgeX Foundry has to take care of, of that part as well. So here are some of the devices that EdgeX Foundry already supports and has uh, the template files for. So for the protocols, it's easy, right? We already have the plugins for that. But for the different devices, they have something called uh, device templates, which are YAML files. And those YAML files contain the required, uh, you know, the conversion of the data format. They contain information about what type of commands the device support, so that it's easy for you then to import this. And then, uh, you know, it'll be different for each device, obviously. We have a few of these already done. A lot of them are not done. I would say that the vast majority does not have a template, but um, it's a YAML file. If you go in there and have a look at it, you can probably recreate something of, uh, of, of this. I've done some for, for my demonstrations where I use Raspberry Pis, so you can just take it and, and make your own version if you like. Uh, so those are available. Now, let's uh, look at the other end. So on the client side, sure, we have support for all this stuff. That's great. But how about the export side? So you could, like we mentioned earlier on, export it to your core data center if you have things there. You can send it off to any of the big clouds, that's great. And it transfers the, the format into JSON, XML, or CSV, or some other one. So if you look at a device here, for example, like BACnet, that sends data to Ajax Foundry, it'll just translate that and send it on to somewhere else. And you, something that is pretty cool about it is that you don't just take the data, right? You send commands to the devices. So on the northbound side, EdgeX Foundry has a REST API, which you can hit. And then you can say, this device, this command, and it will then execute that for you. So for example, if you want to execute that, you send the command via the REST API that you have northbound. And then, then that will be translated over to communicate with some device or some protocol. Now the cool thing about this is, it's kind of like this, right? It's like the Lord of the Rings. You have the one ring that controls all the other stuff. If you want to communicate with all these different edge devices, you don't have to keep in mind all the different protocols, you don't have to keep in mind the different commands that those devices support. You only have to program for that single northbound API that EdgeX is providing. As long as you can communicate with that, as long as your code can talk to that API, EdgeX will translate across to all the other stuff so that you don't have to do it. And you can install it really on anything. However, uh, generally what we tend to do is to install it on an Edge gateway or a box PC or some kind of ruggedized industrial PC. A Raspberry Pi works fine, a Raspberry Pi 4 even. Uh, if you have a 3, you know, you can get the base running, but I would definitely recommend a Raspberry Pi 4 if you want to test it out and um, want to activate all the services. Otherwise, the Raspberry Pi 3 will choke after a little while. So install it there, you can run it close to the edge. So if you're looking at this, diagram that you had before, 
Edgex generally would be on the south end of that diagram. You would install it very close to the devices that you want to control and take metrics from, not on the other end. And that means, of course, that you would be installing Edgex on RIP many, many times. Maybe using the Abrino uh, templates or blueprints, for example. Could be one way of doing it, right? Like we just saw previously in one of the presentations. So that's a way to, to install Edgex and, and run it. So it's kind of like glue, right? It glues together all the edge devices, it glues together all the cloud stuff, right? It bind all that together, and then you have something that actually works. Uh, the only part that is kind of missing is you know, a good device management solution, but I have to look for that elsewhere. Uh, it's kind of outside of scope. So looking at the architecture, right? This is the actual architecture diagram for Edgex Founder today. The purple part that you have in the middle are all the services that are required by default, and you can't live without, it won't work without those services in the middle. The other ones are essentially optional. You don't have to activate them, you don't have to run them. Good if you do, but you don't have to. <coughs> so you have core data, command, metadata, registry, and configuration, and that's enough to run the whole thing. Uh, and then at the bottom layer here, you have all those plugins required for the protocols, and here you have all your devices, right? All the southbound clients. You have a rules engine which you can configure and say, okay, if this data comes in from this device, take this action. Um, or you can just do that outside as well. Or you can do scheduling so you can say, uh, every minute, go and check this device for information. And it's funny, right? Some of the devices you need to check. If you need to get data from something, in some cases, you actually need to set the command first to activate it so you can read data. Then you read the data, and then you change the setting back again. So all of those, you know, maybe you need three calls then to get the single data value. Edgex will have that in its configuration. In the YAML file that we talked about before, that is already in there. So that when you send one command, it will translate that across to maybe three or more commands that are required. And on the top you have the, uh, the distribution layer, which will send that data. Uh, so, let's just take an example. If it is, maybe we get a, a value from a sensor saying that Temperature is over 100 degrees. It comes in via BACnet, goes to core data, stored short term, but it's also sent out directly by the distribution layer, where it will be translated across to JSON or XML or something else. And then we send that off to some cloud or some on-prem solution, whichever we want. Could be that, wow, okay, so we get that data and say, wow, that's, that's way too hot. Then we send a command to the Northbound API, hit the rules engine, and then we issue a command, which can go out over a different protocol, and then stop a machine or change the RPM value or something, or open a vent, whatever you want, right? You can take an action based on that data. So, if you're looking at some use cases, some of the things, it, obviously since we've had the, the first long-term support release being released very recently, we don't have many customers that are using this in production at the moment. Uh, however, uh, use cases that we've had here in APJ over the last year, or 2019, um, have included, for example, as you can see, some of the manufacturing customers. We've had uh, people in India, for example, wanting to use this for uh, robots painting car parts to both get information and to change settings and control the robots. Um, we've had one subway, well, a contractor that does the control of subway access hatches and doors to subways, uh, wanting to use EdgeX to get data um, and to control uh, the locked state of doors. A food manufacturer who wants to control the different devices that they have. So they have uh, a huge amount of different types of devices and machines that have been around for a while and some are newer. So there's a big mix of devices in there. They want to be able to um, essentially take a very old system that they've had and then automate it. Uh, you can uh, utilize Edgex Foundry to, uh, to do that. Um, then we have uh, some smart lamp and surveillance. Uh, we have one customer in particular for the surveillance part that are hooking up uh, cameras to it. <coughs> then they are running inferencing on the data, on the images, and then they take the metadata and they only save the metadata. They throw away the images. Because then if they have the metadata, they already know what's on the video. Uh, and then they don't have to send that data back over the backhaul. Globally, we've also got some building automations where they've been looking at, of course, controlling uh, temperature, humidity, lighting, and also room occupancy. So they'll find if a, if a user is, or a person is in a room or not. So they check that. Plant process, this is for a water treatment plant, uh, treating water, the wastewater. And then uh, we looked at some stuff together with Intel for 
uh, for retail where they want to find out how many people are queuing up for a per certain product or a desk at the same time or uh, where they can check uh, how much stock you have of certain things, right? Those kind of things as well have been utilized uh, globally. So we've got use cases for that. So it is getting much more popular. We've actually seen now, after this summer, we've had the 1.0 release, that uh, the number of downloads of the containers have skyrocketed. So it's, it's been a ridiculous increase in the amount of, of downloads we've seen. So we think that this is really now uh, taking off in, in a real sense. So um, that's pretty much it. There are a few good pages here to have a look at. There's a Slack channel where all of the developers are generally online, which you can just invite yourself to and ask questions. So the people who made it are, are there, so you can just ask. Um, and there are many other things that are quite good. If you're interested, go through the docs and have a look at the API walkthrough, which is really good. That will introduce you to all the different parts of the system you can try out yourself. And it's really installing it, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, if you've got like, you know, a Linux uh, machine, like Ubuntu, and you want to install it, it literally you know, five minutes and you're, you're done. It's very fast, very easy to get started with it. And oh, for the Raspberry Pi, if you want to run on a Raspberry Pi, uh, just use Snaps. Snap install, and then you're off. It's uh, super easy. And then it'll download and install those, uh, those containers that you need for you. Um, so that's pretty much it for me.